Hey, good morning, Fellowship Church. So glad y'all decided to join us. Um, if y'all would stand, you'd clap along. We're going to sing about our God's amazing grace this morning. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king of the all king who shakes the world with holy thunder and leaves his breath
darkest your light is greater you light our way god you light our way when evil is rising oh, you're rising higher with power to save with power to save oh you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you are alive jesus you are alive death had a stronghold but your life was stronger rose from the grave rose up from the She is. You may be seated. Lord, in the morning, you hear my voice. In the morning, I direct my prayer to you and watch. Cast all, all your anxieties on him because he cares for you, for you. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It availeth much. Join us on Saturday, March 27th at the church to pray. Good morning. 
Good to see you this morning. Welcome to Fellowship Church. My name is Paul Valdez, and I'm one of the pastors here. If you're new to Fellowship Church, I just want to say hi. I'm glad you're here and let you know that, in fact, I see my brother Josh Clark there. He would be happy to give you a folder that tells you a little bit more about Fellowship Church, so you can find him out in the foyer after the service. What you just saw was a video promoting the women's event that's going to take place this Saturday on the 27th. This is a non-registered event. We want all the women to gather. It's going to be a really special time for you to get together and to uh, go through a small teaching and then spend the majority of your time praying. And they're going to have stations set up throughout the building, and we need prayer. How many of you believe that? Yes, yes, prayer is powerful. So I just want to encourage you, there's no child care. So women, you just come Saturday morning, and let's get together and let's pray. Also, next Sunday is our Discover class. If you'd like to know more about Fellowship Church and our family, you can fill out the bulletin. Um, you'll see there inside a communication card. And this is uh, for us to know if you'd like to come next Sunday. It's from 1130 to 130, and we meet in the Blue Room, and there you'll get to learn more about us as a family, and we'll have lunch, and we'll have child care provided. So be sure to let us know how many children will be coming in their ages as well. You can drop this off in any of the offering boxes that are in the back. You'll also notice there, there's an area for you to check off if you have a question about a particular ministry. We'd love to uh, give you information about that. If you have a prayer request, this is a great place for you also to fill that out. And again, you can drop that off in one of the boxes in the back. Now, I'm looking for my brother, Paul Ebel. Did he go home? He's probably tired. He's So Paul Ebel and his family, the Ebels, are missionaries that we sent out to Romania. They're in town. They're going to be here in the States for about a month or two. And so next week, we'll have a formal introduction. You'll get to say hi. But he is around here. If you want to say hi to him this morning, uh, be on the lookout for him. And I think that's it. Are you all ready to continue worshiping? Yes, yes. Come on, let's stand. Let's get ready to worship. Psalm 29, it says here, a psalm of David, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let's pray. Father God, You are holy. And Lord, we acknowledge that that is one of the greatest attributes about You, there is none that is holy like you. Father God, I thank you for the blessing of your son who died for us and now reigns in the heavenlies. God, we look forward to his return. And in the meantime, Father God, we worship you in the spirit of thanksgiving for all that you have done. Thank you for gathering us here this morning, Lord, to be worship, to worship you and to adore you, God, as do your name. So, Father, I pray blessings over our time. Thank you, God, for being so real to us. Thank you for this time. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. There's a song called Only a Holy God. Oh. 
like a flood comes flowing down. You know where that is? At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. death was defeated, where the gospel was made. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. 
And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad, and he promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jug of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus, we just want to sit at your feet in this moment today, and we just want to soak up the peace that we have with you. God, speak to us this morning. May we have ears to listen and a heart that is open to receive what you have for us. Jesus, if, if, if we are sinning against you, I pray that you would shed light on that. God, let us repent from it that there wouldn't be anything between us and you and doing what you want us to do in your kingdom here and now. Father, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen next week or next year, but you do. And you are preparing a way for us. God, I pray that we would just trust you and we would follow you. God, we would have courage to lift you up and praise your name and live every day for you. Father, don't let us be like one who sits and dips bread at a table with you and misses the greatest opportunity of spending eternity with you, Father. Don't let us trade eternity for temporary silver. 
empower or whatever else we think we need right now, God. Don't let us get so close to you that we kiss your face and then we miss you. Father, I just ask for your mercy because I know we have done that. But God, I pray that you would just anoint this time this morning. God, may it be a sweet aroma to you as we just open our hearts, God, and we, we open our, our minds and our Bibles, and God, we just we seek to hear you through Chris this morning because nothing else will do. God, only you can fill all of those holes in us. Only you can answer God, all of our questions, only you can mend us. And we just love you and adore you in Jesus' name. We pray these things. Amen. Amen. Isn't God so good? Um, you know, we kept singing the word, um, I surrender, um, in there. And, you know, God gives us opportunities all the time to um, surrender to him and to surrender to his will. And um, you know, today we're talking about a story. If you've ever wondered, has Jesus felt what you felt before? Today is the story for you. Because today, Jesus' friends are going to stab him in the back. He's going to feel betrayed by these things. He's going to feel those emotions that we sometimes feel in our daily walk, or even some people in the church that have been hurt by the church over years and years and years. And today, we want to respond as Jesus responds. We're going to kind of look at the way that Jesus responded to situations and the way that, that Judas responded to the situations. And to be honest with you, yesterday morning, the entire sermon changed because yesterday morning, I was triggered. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever been, anybody out there, can you feel me? You've been triggered before? Um, you know, like for it, what I mean by that is like we all kind of in our hearts and our minds, we kind of have this big console Right? We have this big like spread of buttons. And when you push the buttons in a certain order, sometimes they, the reaction to those things isn't always good. Am, am I the only one who is this way? Y'all feel me? Okay, yeah, some of y'all understand what I'm talking about. Like, for example, like look at this board right here. This is the new and improved like mind board, right? Anybody seen Inside Out? A little bit too realistic movie, right? The happiness and fear and disgust, these different things, right? And when people push the button, sometimes there's a reaction to it. Maybe, maybe this is some of y'all's mind. It looks like this. <laughs> there's a lot of buttons. There's gauges, you know, things like that. There's things happening all over the place, and you got to look around. Some of us, we're more like this, okay? We're simple, like... Man, I got like a few buttons. Just, you know, don't, just don't push the red one, okay? Just don't push the red one. Well, yesterday morning, I got triggered. Yesterday morning, the self-destruct button was right there for me, all right? And you might think, well, what do I mean by that? I had an opportunity yesterday morning to push the button and just like go old school Coach Smith anger mode, right? Now, don't worry. I recognized it, and I was able to step off the crazy train I mean, I just sat in my front yard. If you'd have driven by my house, you'd have thought I was crazy. So I'm just sitting in the front yard, like, staring at dead grass, right? And then just letting the Word of God come into my mind. I'm listening to the Bible and whew, deep breath, right? Close it. Because if we think about it, we have this self-destruct button. It looks a little bit like this, right? The nuclear code button where you got a key, and then you got to turn the key and open the thing and then hit the button, right? And so if you have a self-destruct button, you have to understand this first of all. No one else has access to your self-destruct button. Stop blaming other people. Stop being a victim in these things. You have control of your self-destruct button. Now, people might turn the key. People might start pushing the button. People might tell you, hey, you need to hit it. But you are the one who has to turn the key, open the flap, and hit the button. And I want to encourage you and teach you today from this story how to get off of that crazy train. How do we avoid hitting the self-destruct button? Because you might think, well, it's a self-destruct button. It's only going to hurt me, but it doesn't, does it? When you self-destruct, it hurts the people that are close to you. And we don't want to do that as believers in Jesus Christ. We want to walk as he walked as well. And so I want to encourage you today with some different tips on how to get off that crazy train. But you have to surrender to God in those moments in order to be like Christ. Okay, so let's dive in. We're in Mark chapter 14. We're walking through the entire book of Mark. And let me set the stage for you. This is the kind of um, situation that Jesus is in at this particular moment. Last week, he was on the Mount of Olives. He's teaching us about the abomination of desolation and, and the end and all these sort of things. And then today, we pick up and it says, It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him in stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So here's what's happening around Jesus. The, the chief priests, the Sadducees, the, the Pharisees, they're trying to find a way to find Jesus alone so they can arrest him and so they can kill him. And so Jesus is in this situation where if he strays somewhere, they're going to try to arrest him. They're going to try to kill him. They're going to try to catch him. You ever felt like that before? They're just trying to catch me in something wrong. They're just trying to find an opportunity to get me. That's what Jesus is in the middle of right now in this situation. And so then, you know, Peter, who's recounting this to Mark, gives us a flashback, okay? So in verse 3, we flash back to Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. So we're going we're gonna to flash back a few days to right before Jesus enters into Jerusalem. He's going to tell us a story that is kind of the triggering story for Judas. So we're, we're going to flash back. You can read this account in John chapter 12 as well. So maybe that's some homework for you. Write it down. Check out John 12. Kind of cross-reference it when you get there. But here's what it says in verse 3. We're flashing back. And it says, And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. So he's in a house of Simon the leper. Now we know if you have leprosy, you're supposed to be outside the city, unclean, unclean. But now he's Simon the leper. He's been healed. He's been made whole again. And he's now hosting a dinner, right? Who made him whole? We don't know, but we're going to assume probably Jesus, right? This is probably a man who's had an interaction with Jesus at another time. And he's now hosting a dinner. Now, Simon was an extremely common name, right? We had Simon Peter, right? We had Simon the leper here. We had Simon the Pharisee, which in Capernaum, if you look in Luke chapter 7, in Capernaum, Simon the Pharisee had an anointing dinner with Jesus. But this was two years earlier than the event that's happening here. So lots of Simons out there in the world of Galilee and these different areas. So Simon the leper is hosting this party. Who's at this party? Well, Jesus is there, the disciples are there, Simon the leper's there. We also know that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are there, okay, because John 12 gives us kind of a list of who's in this situation. Each one of them is going to, in this situation, love God in their way, right? If you think about Martha, how does Martha show love to somebody? By serving them, right? She's going around the house, she's serving, she's doing different things. How does Mary show love to Jesus throughout the Bible? Sitting at his feet, listening, paying attention. And if you think about this scenario, think about it like you went over to this house, what kind of stories were being told? Like Simon the leper's like, yeah, dude, I had three fingers. It was crazy. And Jesus came up and touched me. And then I, that grew back. It was so crazy. Like talking about all this story, right? And, and Lazarus is sitting over there chilling like, hey, I got a good story. <laughs> I, was, I was a mummy. I was dead, right? And Jesus said, come out. And I, I just got up. I don't know what happened. I just came out of there, right? So th this is the stories that are going on all around Jesus, having these conversations. Oh, you think that was good? The disciples chime in. You should have seen when he did this. And all these stories are going around talking about glorifying Jesus. Hopefully these are how your dinner parties are. Talking about Jesus. Talking about what Jesus is doing in your life. What's he doing in my life? And we're praying for one another, encouraging one another, and so on. And in the midst of this time, Mary, right, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, she gets up and it says, as he was reclining at the table. So I don't know how you picture the Last Supper table, but they were reclining, right? They weren't sitting like you see in the painting, right? They were laying on the ground. They had pillows behind them, just chilling on an elbow, and they're eating their dinner, right? And here comes Mary with this, this alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard. We know this is called spike nard, right? And it was very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. And so she takes, this is the first biblical instance of essential oils being used, okay, in the midst of this time, okay. You, you don't believe me, look it up, spikenard, spikenard essential oil, it's supposed for calming effect. Is it supposed to have this woody, musky smell, which I don't know what that means, okay, because I'm a sneezer. Anybody? Like, hey, smell this, and you smell it, and you spend five minutes sneezing afterwards. So I don't know what it means, but there, this is the idea that she's pouring this expensive ointment. It has this strong smell, and it's now enveloped the whole room. And, and this is the picture, right? What does Messiah mean? Anybody know? The anointed one. So here Mary is anointing him for his burial because Jesus is going to be hung on a cross, and he's not going to get a proper burial. 
He's being hung on the cross and being put in Joseph's tomb. And then later on, on the first day of the week, right, they're going to come back to try to anoint his body. And so Mary gives this anointing sacrifice, this expensive, this very costly gift. And in fact, in the next scene, we see how expensive it really was because the disciples, specifically Judas, kind of freak out on her, right? So there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, poor, and they scolded her. So when you picture this scene, right, Jesus is reclining, Mary is pouring this oil on her. When you think of it, do you think of it as a beautiful scene? Or does it stir indignant scolding in you? When you see someone sacrificing and giving what is theirs, giving of themselves, does it inspire you? Does it encourage you? Or does it cause you to, to judge and to be critical? And this is the two scenarios that we're seeing here. And so if you want to be like Christ, you want to be a person who doesn't hit the self-destruct button, here's the first thing. Be a grace giver, not a fault finder. Be a grace giver, not a fault finder. Because here Judas is, and he finds faults with the sacrifice that she's giving to Jesus. What does he say here? He said, he said indignantly, why was this ointment wasted? This gift that she gave him, he calls it a waste, right? What is he wasting? 300 denarii. Now, we know what a denarii is, right? We've been talking about this throughout the time. It was a day's wage. So 300 days wages. A year's worth of salary was the amount of this gift. Now, think about that in today's terms, what that would cost you. Would you give that to Jesus? This is most likely a family heirloom. Mary probably couldn't afford to just go out and buy this. This has been something that they'd saved over time in their family, and yet she says it is worth it. Nothing, nothing is better than Jesus. Is that how you see things? Do we see things through Mary saying, I'm willing to sacrifice any for you. You gave me the life of my brother back. You've given me eternal life. Anything I have is yours. And this is the attitude of Mary in there, but not for Judas. Why? Because Judas was in charge of the money bag. Because Judas had been kind of helping himself to the things that were in there. And Judas sees the same situation that Jesus calls beautiful, that Mary is sacrificing and giving of herself, giving something valuable, and Judas sees it with anger and scolds her. Are you a grace giver? What does that mean? Well, grace means that you're giving unconditional love to someone who doesn't deserve it. So they don't deserve it. They don't deserve your love. And yet you choose to give it to them anyway. Or forgiveness. Forgiveness is when you don't hold someone to the punishment they deserve. Listen to these words, right? They have done something wrong to you. But yet you choose not, you can't forgive people who don't do wrong to you, right? You forgive people that legitimately have done something wrong, but you choose because Christ has forgiven you to forgive others. Because how great a gift is it that God forgave us? While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. We should be extending grace to other people in the same way. This is how you stay off the crazy train. This is how you stay off of the self-destruct button as you give grace instead of judgment, instead of finding faults the things that are there. And then Jesus gives us that example here, and he says this, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for my burial. She understood something about what was happening to where this was the time for her to give this gift. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. What was the memory? What is the legacy that Mary had was that her gift was going to be told for generations and generations afterwards because she was willing to give what was costly for the Lord. She was willing to submit to him. What is Judas's legacy? Nobody named their kids Judas, did you? Probably not. Anybody named their kids Mary? 
there's legacy, there's, a, there's effects to the things that we do in our world. Look what, Jesus, what Judas does next in verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And he, said, and he heard it, and they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought out an opportunity to betray him. So Judas chooses to harden his heart. You see, Jesus gave him an opportunity. Jesus was teaching him, this is how you should view this situation. And Judas said, no. Question, are you teachable? If you want to avoid the self-destruct button, you have to be teachable instead of disregarding or discarding the rebukes of others. If someone comes up to you and says, hey, I see this in your life. You really should work on this. Are you willing to submit and be teachable in that moment? Because, guys, we're not always going to agree, right? We're not going to agree on everything. So are we willing to be teachable? So are we willing to submit to the Spirit of God as he teaches us from his word? Or are we going to harden our heart? Are we going to resist the Holy Spirit when he wants to, to lead us and teach us? Be teachable. So what do we know? Be grace-giving. Be teachable. These are keys for us to get off of the self-destruct button, to stop us before we wreck the people around us because we choose to see situations wrongly. All right, let's look at verse 12, because this is really interesting. We now know that the chief priests are trying to, to catch Jesus. Judas is trying to betray Jesus. And so when you know this scenario, look at what Jesus says in this, because it sounds like a spy thriller. Because Jesus is giving them directions, but he gives it to them in this like cryptic kind of weird way. So, so see if you notice that in this verse, in verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now, by the way, the timing of all these things is really interesting, and we don't have time to dive into it today, but next Sunday night, we're going to do a teaching on when was the crucifixion. Steve Howard, one of our members, is going to teach. He's done a ton of research on the sign of Jonah. So next Sunday night at 7 p.m., if you want to come find out evidence for a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, crucifixion stuff, that's your night. If you're curious about those things, come next Sunday night. So we're not talking about timing here, but we know that Jesus has said to them, they've asked, where should we go do the Passover, right? And so verse 13 says, and he sent two of the disciples, and he said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, this, the teacher says, where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he went, and, sh and he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, there prepare for us. So here's what Jesus' directions are. Go into the city, find a guy carrying a jar of water, follow him, wherever he ends up, ask if they have an upper room. This is like, have you ever, have you ever gotten country directions? <laughs> right? Like you drive out to Dale, you're like, yeah, that fourth cow turned left. And you're going to drive about, you know, just a little ways down there. And when you see the house with the columns, and one of the columns is broken, but just turn right there, and our house is right there. Right? This is what Jesus said. Go into the city, look for a guy with a jar, follow him. Right? This is like stealth mode. Why? Because Judas is looking for an opportunity to betray him. If Judas knows where they're having the Passover, he's going to tell the chief priests who are going to go arrest him away from the crowds. So Jesus is stealth mode is like, hey, go do this. And then Judas doesn't know where they're going to do that that evening. That's why the betrayal happens in the Garden of Gethsemane, because of Jesus' habit of praying to the Father. We'll talk about that next week. But so interesting how Jesus gives them this, like, code that's in there. I think it's so cool. All right, verse 17. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. And it got awkward. Right? If you're at dinner and we're sitting down together, and I know one of you is going to stab me in the back tonight. And I just start looking around. You get that nervous laugh you have, right? It's like, huh? is it me? Like you start, you're like wondering. And there's this pause in the ceremony and what's going on in this dinner. And I wonder, I just wonder, Judas hadn't betrayed him yet. Was there still a chance for Judas to step off, get away from the button? Was there that chance? You see, are you going to be willing to be humble, or are you going to harden your heart? 
See, Judas' heart was so hard at this point that it didn't matter. He wasn't willing to listen to Jesus. You know, when you have that sin that's so much entangling you, but the Bible says that he will always give you a way out, you still have to take the way out, don't you? You still have to submit and surrender to, like, I'm going to take this way instead of stepping into my sin, and Judas doesn't do that. But Jesus says, you know, hey, one of you can betray me, and they all look around, and they start asking, and they begin to be sorrowful, and they said to him one after another, is it I? Like, hey, is it, is it me? I don't think it's me, but is it me? And they start asking each other, like, what's happening here? And he said to them, it is one of the twelve one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. One of the 12, they've been following Jesus for three years. He's walking on water, he's calming storms, he's feeding 5,000 people, and they still don't listen. They still betray him. We say, how could that happen? How could you experience Jesus in that way and still not know him as Lord and Savior? In Texas, the Bible Belt How many people know about Jesus but won't submit to him? How many people think they know, have this relationship with Christ, but they don't really submit to him as Lord and Savior? It's the same thing that's happening here where Judas has seen all these things, and yet the cares of the world, the money bag, these things have tempted him and led him astray to where he betrays Jesus. And they began to be sorrowful, right? Is it I? Is it I? And they look around, and Jesus tells them, For the Son of Man, this is verse 21, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. In other words, the legacy that Judas leaves generation after generation is one who denied, who rejected, who betrayed the Savior of the world. And that's the legacy that is left behind. We don't want that to be our legacy. We don't want to get so caught up in the things that are going around us that we ruin our legacy by hitting the self-destruct button and ruining our witness with the people that are around us. We want to choose to follow Christ, to submit to him in everything that we do. How do we do that? How can we walk that way? We have to remember what Christ has done for us. Do you realize what Christ has done for you? The freedom that you have in Christ because he has washed away your sins? I mean, literally, the Passover, right, if you read Exodus chapter 12, is where they sacrificed this lamb, and and the blood was put on the doorpost so that the angel of death would cross over them so their sins would be forgiven. We just sang it, your your love run red, right? So that Christ's blood will cover us and give us an opportunity at eternal life. Do you understand it? Do you, you understand what Christ has done for us? That's why it's easy for us to forgive. You see, what happens to us in our walk with Christ too often is that we have these like ideal expectations of how we want God to act. Like, for example, when you think about Easter time, right, your ideal Easter time, are you frolicking with a basket through a field with pastel sunrise? And like, is that your ideal Easter? Like, when you think about ideal Easter, would you pick the Bible's version of the resurrection? Betrayal, denial, beating, bloody death, all because he's going to be risen. You see, we have this ideal picture of how we want our life to go, and it doesn't always go that way. And in those moments, we trust Jesus. It doesn't always end up like we want it to end up, does it? That could be a thousand of our testimonies. Yet we say, your will be done. Lord, whatever you want, we trust you with it. So I just want to encourage you to remember what Christ has done for you. And, and Christ gives us a way to remember him through the Lord's Supper. Let's look at what he says here in verse 22. He says, And as they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them. And he said, Take, this is my body, right, which we know was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks... He gave it to them, and they drank of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's Supper. And you might be thinking, well, this would be a great day to do the Lord's Supper in church. I mean, we're just reading this passage and everything. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want to challenge you when you leave this place to go and grab 
the Lord's Supper elements and to go home, to read this story, for someone in your household to lead your family in the Lord's Supper. If you have an upper room, go to the upper room. If you don't have an upper room, have someone carry a water jar. Follow them from the outside and walk into your room and do it. Play act it. I don't know. We have to find a way, guys, to make this more than just a book that we read and make it an experience as we put the truth of God together with our life experiences. This is how we can get off the crazy train. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, man, what puts you on the crazy button yesterday morning? I was working out. And if you haven't figured it out, I'm not in ideal peak condition yet. Still working on that, okay? But I went and I worked out at Camp Gladiator. It was endurance day. So you had to run these laps, right? And so I'm, I'm walking these laps, right? So walking is walking and jogging combined, okay? I'm not quite to like jogging and walking yet. So I'm just like, whew, do my thing, right? And people are just like, zoom, zoom. My wife, love her. She's a beast. Zoom, zoom. She's like, hi, honey. And I'm like, <gasps> I'm just dying, right? And something like broke in me because I'm a coach, man. I'm a competitive guy. And I used to run long distance. I was a miler and a two miler. I used to be the pre- lapping people, and I'm just getting past, and they're like, do lunges, okay, right, and then I, I got to run some more, and I'm in pain, and my mind just like breaks, you're a loser, you're, you're terrible, how did you let yourself get this way, and like all these lies just started bombarding me, and I'm still like trucking, right, I'm just trucking, right, and it, it just breaks, and then what happens when you break, you hurt the people closest to you, that's why we have to get off of this train and say, no, no, those are not right thoughts. I'm not this. I'm not that. What does Christ say about me? I'm the son of the king. I'm forgiven. I'm whole in him, right? We, we tell ourselves these things from scripture and we begin to believe those things and trust in him. And then we get motivated to work out even more so we don't get past next time. But we say to ourselves, no, this is not who I am. And we get off of that. We remember what Christ has done for us. So here's my challenge to you. Are you willing to go home and do it together? Are you willing to play out this scene before you're like, but I don't know what to do. Read Mark 14, verses 22 and following. And then look what it says in verse 26, and we'll close with this. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they finished their time by singing together. And what did they sing? They sang Psalm 118. Let's go back to it. You've heard some of this psalm before. But it was traditional for them to sing this psalm at the end of their meal together. And see if you recognize any of the Christology in this psalm as we read it together. We're going to start in verse 1. This is something I'd encourage you when you get done with the Lord's Supper at home with your family is to read this psalm together. Here's what it says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Do we believe that? That his steadfast love endures forever? I hope so. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. In case you haven't figured it out yet, let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. We got to believe it. For out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me, and he set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side, my helper, and I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me in the name of the Lord, and I cut them off. They surround me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees, and they went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. That's a verse you need to remember. The Lord is my strength and my song. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts, and the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I might enter through them 
and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and, I have, become, and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We can say that today because it's beautiful out there. Do you give thanks to the Lord for it? Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Lord, we thank you so much for your steadfast love. Your love is steadfast. Help us to be like you. Lord, I pray that as we interact with the world and we see um, things happen around us, Lord, help us to see them through your eyes, through the eyes of grace. Help us to be humble. Help us to give grace to all, just as you have forgiven us. So, Lord, I pray for us this week that we will avoid the crazy button, that we will avoid self-destruction in our own lives so that we can be a witness for you in our home, in our marriages, with our kids, in our workplace. Lord, help us to be an example of Christ's love to the world. Lord, I pray as we go home and we celebrate the Lord's Supper that, Lord, you will be the Lord of our homes, that we will be able to trust you, we will to see you at work in our homes and submit to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Man, thank you, Chris, for bringing the message and the challenge for us uh, within our families uh, to live for Christ and remember what he did on the cross for us. Um, we're going to be dismissing at this time. Uh, I want to encourage you. The, the e-bells are here from Romania. Come talk to them. Uh, hear their story, what God's doing in their life. Uh, and if you head out this right, this door on the, on the right, uh, the communion uh, is right over there for you to pick up the elements and do it at your home. And if you're online, thank you for coming. Um, if you want the elements as well, we can find a way to get them to you. Uh, so we love you guys. Y'all have a great day. Lost, but he broke.